versus reacting part two. And I started by saying last week that we have all been taught somehow um, and, and have a tendency to pray fervently when there's a crisis. When a crisis arises, uh, when there's a need, uh, when there's some kind of discomfort, whether it be emotional discomfort or physical discomfort, <clears throat> mental discomfort, uh, where there's pain of any sort, hurt, hurt in our heart or hurt phys pain physically, or where there's a doctor's report or there's a demand made on ourselves or on our resources, or even if there's an opportunity that presents itself, we have all learned that when these things happen, then that drives us to fervent prayer, it drives us to pray really hard. You know, we <clears throat> all tend to have, excuse me, We all tend to have, um, I'm going to put it this way, standard prayers that we pray. Our usual, you know, tends to have a form or a pattern, our standard prayers. And we can actually, if we're honest, you can coast on that. We can coast on that. And more often than not, we have coasted on it. But then when something really happens, then we get, we, I'm going to pray really hard. I'm, going to really, I'm really going to pray hard now, Lord. I'm really praying hard. And so we've tended to do that, to pray fervently, to pray earnestly, to pray with all our heart. You know, our physical bodies get involved in the prayer. And we've tended to, done, to, to have only done that really when crisis has presented itself, when a need has presented itself. And praying really fervently at those times is good. There's nothing wrong with that. It's valid. And it's the Father's heart to give us the kingdom in every situation that we face. And God has a solution for every problem, every challenge, and every difficulty. He always does. Can I get an amen? amen? But, however, but because this has been our mode, our mode of kind of we just have coasting prayers that we normally pray, and then having these really important times where we really fervently pray, pray, pray from our hearts from, to, to God, because this has been our mode, we pray in reaction to difficulty. Uh, it means that seemingly we have a tendency to being on the back foot, being on the defense rather than the offense. So we're praying defensive prayers. Something happened, something has happened, and it's already happened, or you know, and then, then we, we're praying towards it, praying towards it. And I said, there's nothing wrong with that, but if it's our, God is moving us into having a different mode, having us on the front foot, being on the proactive side, on the, um, yeah, proactive side rather than the defensive side, the offensive side, being on the offense instead of the defense, i.e. Praying in, praying in defense means we're praying in reaction to something. It's highlighted, uh, how the Lord has wanted us to, to come into this new place, is highlighted in Matthew 26 and verse 41. And I looked at it in the mas message uh, paraphrase. And it says this in the message paraphrase. And I chose it because it's in kind of an everyday language, this, uh, the message. And it says, stay alert. Okay, backstory. Jesus is at the Garden of Gethsemane. He's had the Last Supper. The, he's instituted the new covenant with his disciples. And he has gone up to the Garden of Gethsemane, Gethsemane with the disciples, which actually was his habit. They, they would go up there quite often just to be together. Um, but this particular time, guess what? You know what was about to happen? The soldiers were going to come and arrest him. But before the soldiers came and arrested him, he, he, started, he was feeling the pressure of what was about to happen. And he told three of his disciples, pray. And then he took his th three closest uh, friends, if, as it were, Peter, James, and John. He took them a little way away from the others. And he said, he was saying this to them. He's saying this, stay alert. Be in prayer so that you don't wander into temptation without even knowing you're in danger. There is a part of you that is eager ready for anything in God. But, we say but, but there's another part that is, that's as lazy as an old dog sleeping by the fire. Have you ever seen a picture of an old dog sleeping by a fire? You know, in the places where there's winter, you know, he's cuddled up, he's, he's settled. I'm there, I ain't moving. It 
In the New King James Version of that same scripture, it says it like this. Jesus said, watch and pray. That's how most of us would remember that scripture. Watch and pray. He's telling his disciples and he's also telling us at this time. Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing. That's what it refers to in the message as the, there's a part of you that's eager, ready for anything in God. But he says, the flesh is weak. The flesh, our human human nature, our human weakness, human frailty, our soulishness, that's the part that's like an old dog sleeping by the fire, doesn't really want to engage in the things in God. And Jesus is bringing this house, he's bringing the body of Christ into that place now. And it's not somewhere, I get the impression, it's not somewhere he's, it's like, okay, well, take your time and move into it. It's like, go. Step into this mode now. It's a lifestyle. Look, everybody, look at your neighbor and say lifestyle. Look at your neighbor and say, what's your style? Because, you know, we have a lifestyle. Style. Our lifestyle is what we've chosen. We've chosen our lifestyle, you know. It's just the same as we've chosen the clothes that we're wearing and we choose our hairstyle. We choose our style of dress. We choose our hairstyle. We also choose our lifestyle. And so a lifestyle, this is what Jesus is pointing us to, a lifestyle of ongoing communion with the Lord insulates you, insulates us from temptation, from, I should say, from falling into temptation, from taking part with temptation, from partnering with temptation. <clears throat> Jesus, as we know, was tempted in every way but without sin. So temptation is not sin. Being tempted is not sin. But when we give in to temptation, when we partner with temptation, when we entertain the temptation, it inevitably, look at your neighbor say, it's inevitable, you will fall into sin. And when sin is conceived, it brings death. And death, it, 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 in, in this sense, it might be physical death. Yes, that's a reality. But it also brings death into your experience, your life experience. Brings misery and torment. All that's part of the dying process. Misery, torment. Is a result of sin. And so Jesus is telling us, the Holy Spirit is telling us right now, listen, a lifestyle of ongoing communion. I use the word ongoing communion instead of prayer because sometimes when some of us hear the word prayer, it, 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 you know, it's so formal. It, it, it feels like, you know, a set kind of prayer or, you know, full of, full of these and thous and King James language. But prayer is communion, it's conversation, it's fellowship with God. And so a lifestyle of ongoing communion with the Lord insulates you and me from falling into temptation. That's good news. I don't have to sit. I was telling the folks last night that temptation is going to come your way. It is. It comes our way multiple times during the day. And when, when we say temptation as well, we may be thinking, oh, well, no, I'm not tempted to murder anybody. Or I'm not tempted to covet my neighbor's donkey. Or I'm not tempted to whatever. So, no. No. But anything, that which is a without faith is sin, it tells me in my Bible in Romans. That which is without faith is sin to the believer. So anytime we're tempted to do anything that's without faith, that is sin to us. So worry, that is sin. Fretting, sin. Gossip, sin. When the Holy Spirit is saying, don't watch that show, don't watch that show, don't watch that show, don't watch that show, don't watch that program, don't watch it, don't watch it. He tells you every time, you know, don't, wa don't watch it, don't watch it. And we're like, oh yeah, but I want to know what happened in the end. 
I'm already invested in it. And he's saying, don't watch it, don't watch, don't watch it. He's telling you for your own good. It's not for him, it's for you. Don't watch it, don't watch it. He's like, no. I want to hear what happened in the end. Sin. But of course, we fall short of the glory God has for us. So a lifestyle of ongoing communion with the Lord insulates you and me from temptation. Temptation will come, but we can watch it walk on by. It doesn't have nothing to do with me. I'll see you coming, but you can just walk on by. I'm not getting involved. The main purpose of prayer is really about catching the Lord's heart, catching his heart, catching his heart, being in tune with his heart, with what's on his mind, with what he's focusing, his heart concerning you, yourself, concerning the people around you, concerning your world and concerning the world. And as I said, the main purpose of prayer is really about catching his heart. You know, the more you spend some time with people, the more you catch their heart. As a family living together in a house, we live together in our house. We live together. We spend time together. We know each other. Intimately, we know each other. That we can tell, nobody has to say anything, but we can tell if one of us is upset or not feeling well or tired or because we have each other's heart, because we spend time, we're together. So we don't have to even say anything to each other because we have each other's heart. Heart, because we spend time with each other. We're in communion with each other. It's the same thing with the Lord, you know, and our personal relationship with him. The more we spend time with him, the more we catch his heart. And we can tell when he's grieved about whatever. We can tell when he's joyful. And So the main, I'm going to say it again. The main purpose of prayer is really about catching his heart. Can we put it up there? Can you say that with me? The main purpose of prayer is really about catching his heart. And so that when we come to the point that prayers, we talk about communion with him, and that's prayer. But also when we come together as corporate body, we come together to intercede. That's another type of prayer. When we intercede, not on our behalf, but on behalf of somebody else, maybe another person that has come to your heart, another family Uh, uh, maybe a neighbor, uh, maybe somebody in the community, maybe your community, maybe your neighborhood. When we're interceding on behalf of the city, interceding on behalf of this nation, interceding on behalf of the nations in the earth, interceding on behalf of uh, persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ that we always pray for, we do so out of the product of this relationship. So when we are praying, we're praying his heart because we're accustomed to being attuned with his heart. Heart, so we catch his heart concerning a situation, and so we pray that rather than what I think they put that person should do and how I think they should fix their problem and what I think what they need to do. In my opinion, they should. Ouch! Or amen. Amen. You see, he can then guide us with his eye so that we co-labor with his heart, becoming a people who seek him so we mirror his nature in the earth. It's glorious. Look at your neighbor and say, You get to mirror his nature in the earth today and every day. And we can pray as co-laborers to see change. It's a prayer life style. A servant doesn't know what the master is doing, but a friend does. Jesus said, 
he was talking to his disciples. I think it's John 14, but don't quote me on that. It's somewhere around, I think it probably is John 14, 13 or 14. And uh, he's talking, he's chatting, it might be 15. He's chatting with them and... Um, and he says, you know, and, 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 and Thomas says, you know, well, show us the Father. And he says, mm -hmm. oh, I don't know if he did that, but I, if it were me, I'd be like, have I been with you this long and you ask me, show me the Father? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That's what he said. And then he goes on to say, I am in the Father. And you're in me and I am in you. Oh, that gets me so every day when I think. He says, I am in the Father and you're in me and I am in you. Ooh -wee. Mm -mm -mm. And even when we get, when we, as, we, as, we, as we progressively, as we're growing in this thing and f uh, living a lifestyle of communion with him, he's so awesome. He is so awesome. When situations and crises and demands and challenges and difficulties do arise in our personal lives, we get to look at them from his perspective now and not from our perspective, not from our, the old man's perspective, but from his perspective. It's a lifestyle. He makes us like him. We were created for that, you know. There's only one reason that why, why mankind is alive. There's only reason, there's only one reason why there's a, a, a creature called man. Man means mankind, men and women. There's only one reason why there's a creature, a creation called man, mankind on the earth. It's for his image. God said, let us make mankind in our own image and likeness. That's the only reason there's a creation called man alive. It's for his image. <laughs> so we get to mirror his image. His nature on the earth as we spend more and more time with him. And yes, I was sharing with the folks last night. Yes, it's wonderful to have our time blocked off, you know, whatever time that is. And for instance, for some people, myself, it's in, in the morning time. You know, you have your time blocked off to spend time with him. No phone, no no WhatsApp and all that, you know. No, no, no phone ringing, you know, before the time, before you get up and the house is busy. You know, your time alone with him, you've just in the wood, you've got his word because he, he he speaks through his word so you have his word and you're just fellowshipping with him enjoying him and enjoying the Holy Spirit and just spending time with him and that's fantastic that's brilliant and for some of us maybe that time is not according to our schedule so perhaps and we can't make time at then but perhaps it's lunchtime for you maybe you're at work and you you block off your lunchtime to do that or perhaps for some people that people some people are night people you know they're just more awake and alert at the end in the night and so perhaps maybe nighttime is your time you know you block off time alone with him and and all that is fantastic and all that is necessary and all that is absolutely vital and yes we're talking about that but we're talking about spending the day with him so that you know, we, let's say for myself, I spent the morning, I spent the time with him in the morning. But when I get up, get off my knees, and I start moving around the day, it's not like, okay, Lord, you're there, and then I'd, let me just get on with my business today. All through the day, let me be in fellowship with him. Oh, Lord, you're so good. Oh, Lord, I'm driving the car. Oh, God, you're good. You are my champion. I'm singing to him because I know he's right here. It's a lifestyle. And as we continue to do that, you know what? Have you ever had this? And I asked the folks last night, and I'm sure everybody does. Everybody here has. You had an impression on your heart, just like an impression or thought ran across your mind to call this person or that person. 
and you call that person, and just as you call them, and you, you just say, hi, you know, I was just calling to say, hi, you ran across my mind, or you ran across my heart, or I just saw you in my mind, and I just called you to say hi, and they will say, oh, thank God, you know, I am so glad you called me. I just needed to hear an encouraging voice just now, this minute. Or you know what just happened? Have, have you ever had that? That's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. And we begin to pick up his heart. And the Lord speaks to us very often internally. Sometimes it sounds like your own voice. Mm, it's so good. I was, I was reading this morning about, I was reading uh, something in 1 Kings, and it was with regard to Elijah. And Elijah, after he had uh, defeated the prophets of Baal, and he, had, he ran away from Jezebel's threats, and, uh, uh, and uh, <sighs> the Lord said to him, come out into my presence. At the, at the entrance of the cave and the mountain, I'm paraphrasing, of course. And it said there was a great wind. And there was a great wind. And the wind was so great that it was actually splitting rocks. Can you imagine a wind that great? And it says, but the Lord was not in the wind. And then there was a great earthquake. An earthquake. An earthquake. And it says, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And then it says there was a great fire. Can you imagine? This literally happened. I mean, I don't know what was going on with Elijah, but I've been like, okay, kill me now, you know. <laughs> there was a great wind that was splitting rocks. Then there was a, an earthquake. And I'm in a mountain, a cave. An earthquake's not good. I, I'm not in the right place for an earthquake. <laughs> And then there was a great fire. Can you imagine you see those fires in, in Australia and those fires in, in, a, in a California and you see the raging fire. There was a great fire, but it says God was not in the fire. And then there was a still, small voice. And that was the voice of the Lord. Mm. So you begin to pick up his heart. But it's not as a result of striving. It's not like, oh, Lord, speak to me. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, oh, Lord. You know, sometimes we get into that. We're striving. We're striving. And it's like we're pulling teeth and we want to sweat blood. God, speak. I'm striving. Come on. It's not as a result of striving or travailing. Rest. Shape my heart, Lord. As I rest in you, you shape my heart. As I spend time with you, as I engage you, as I enjoy my relationship with you, you're all I want. You're all I'm interested in. All that is the outcome of a lifestyle of fellowship, a lifestyle of friendship, a lifestyle of communion with him. It's called prayer. My responsibility, check this out, check this quote out. I got this from Bill Johnson, and I was like, what? This is so good. My responsibility is not to react to the devil. It's to respond to the Father. My, re my responsibility is not to react to the devil. The devil does something, so now I'm... But it's to live a life of response to the Father. Do we have to deal with the devil and pull down his strongholds? Yes, we do. Do you know the strongholds are here? Yes, we do. But our lifestyle is, is, is in response to the Father. Many pursue God for the breakthroughs in their lives. Many pursue God for, the, for breakthroughs in their personal lives with great hunger and great desperation. But many times, can I tell you, this leads to unbelief. They pursue God for great breakthroughs in their lives with great hunger and great desperation. 
God, I need breakthrough in this area. Whatever it is, I need breakthrough. The many times it leads to unbelief, it leads to discouragement, and that leads to dismay, discouragement. And unbelief, unbelief is you're going through all the motions, you raise the hand, praise the Lord, hallelujah, all that. But yet in your heart, you're like, mm, this ain't, this ain't happened yet. And I maybe ain't going to happen. That's unbelief. That passion of the soul passion of the soul that is dependent on an answer, dependent on the answer that they want to be satisfied, can lead to unbelief. But the flip side to that that same passion of the soul, the great hunger that leads to a person, which is Jesus Christ, leads to growth, leads to joy, leads to peace, regardless of the outcome of that thing. That passion of the soul, take that that's crying out for this whatever is breakthrough, that thing that you want, and take that and turn it to passion of soul for him. Lord, I've come to you, and I've just come to get to know you, to spend time with you. That's the whole reason why I come to you. It's just like the, the uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They are before Nebuchadnezzar. Is it Nebuchadnezzar? Yeah, Nebuchadnezzar. And they say, you know, king, you know, with all due respect, you know, we respect you, but we will not bow. And even if the Lord doesn't save us, we're still not bowing. If we burn, we burn. How's that for faith? Even if I don't get what I want, when I want it, how I want it, that's not the reason I'm coming to you, Lord. I'm coming to you because you are my champion. I've come to get to know you, to spend time with you, to hear your voice, to, reach, to catch your heart. The number one desire of my soul is to know you. Delayed answers prune the soul and the heart. Instant answers increase faith, yes, you know, when you have that situation, you get an instant, you pray and you get that instant answer. Wow, that's so cool. I love those. Thank you, Lord. More of those. Love it. Yes, please. Yeah? Uh, <laughs> yes, please. That's my preferred route. That's good. And faith is increased because you see that God is saying, here I am. Look, there it is. I, it, and every time he does something for us, it's... Not so much for us to wallow in the answer, but it, it's pointing to him. Every answered prayer should drive us more to him. And, and so instant, instant answers, quick answers that come very quickly, they increase our faith, yes. But when we have to exercise enduring faith, that means the answers have not come. It ain't looked like it's come in any way nor how, but we continue to lean our entire human personality upon him in absolute trust and confidence in his power, in his wisdom and his goodness. That works out character and maturity in us. Enduring faith gets answers with character. Philippians chapter 3. 
Let's look at verse 9. I was telling the folks that we're actually going to verse 10, but I needed to start in verse 9 before I go to verse 10. Philippians chapter 3. It's all about getting to know him and spending time with him. That's what prayer is about. And the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says in verse 9, and he's saying that I may actually be found and known as in him. That is, my identity is him. He is my identity. Not having any self-achieved righteousness that can be called my own based on my obedience to the law's demands. That's ritualistic uprightness and supposed right standing with God thus acquired. So let, let my righteousness not be that which I do for myself. Um, you know, oh, I'm, I'm doing everything right. Everything I know to do, I'm doing right. So, and because I know I'm doing everything I know to do right, I'm counting that as my righteousness. I'm righteous before God because I'm doing everything right. No. No. But he goes on to say, but, but say but. But he says, possessing, that genuine righteousness which comes through faith in Christ, the anointed one. The truly right standing with God which comes from God by saving faith. That my righteousness is because of what he's imputed to me. That's the only way I stand righteous before God. is because of his righteousness that he's given me. Everything I think I'm doing right is, counts for nothing. That doesn't mean to say that we don't do right. But my righteousness before God is because I believe what Jesus done and he's paid the price for me and I have taken, I've received the gift of his righteousness. Can I hear you in the overflow? Verse 10. For my determined purpose is that I may know him, that I may progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him, perceiving and recognizing and understanding the wonders of his person more strongly and more clearly, and that I may in that same way come to know, that word know means be intimate with him, with it, come to know the power outflowing from his resurrection, which it exerts over believers. I want to know the power of his resurrection that it exerts over believers. And honey, we have not stepped into it yet. Can I tell you? But he's bringing us to the place that we're stepping into it now. <laughs> we come alive in the river. For my determined purpose is that I may know him, that I may progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him, perceiving and recognizing and understanding the wonders of his person more strongly and more clearly, and that I may in that same way come to know the power outflowing from his resurrection, which it exerts over believers, and that I may so share his sufferings as to be continually transformed in its in spirit, into his likeness, even to his death, in the hope. I was showing with the folks last night that that last part about the suffering. I, listen, this is a scripture I would quote almost every day. But you see that part about the sufferings? I'd leave that part out completely. I was like, mm -mm, no suffering, no suffering, no, thank you. No suffering. And, and where, where it's talking about to share his sufferings, it does not mean that we climb up Golgotha, get whipped, get hung on a cross, like some, some religions actually do that. 
Every Easter, people get whipped, they're bleeding, and then they, 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 get, they get crucified, literally. Or some religions, what they do is they, they crawl on their kneel, knees for penance up, up to some mountain or, or up to some kind of shrine. So-called Christ, Christians, quote-unquote, you know, till their knees bleed and they think that's penance, that's sharing his suffering. No, it's not talking about that. Jesus did that. He did it on our behalf. Where it talks about that I may so share his sufferings, it's the challenge of living as a child of God, as a son and daughter of God in this world system that we're living in. The rejection, words spoken against you, rejection of family, rejection of friends, people misunderstanding you, us, the hurt and the pain that goes along with that, with not bowing. That's the suffering. For some of us, it's literal. When we think of our brothers and sisters in Christ who are missionaries, who are sent out, and they leave the comfort of their own home and their own stuff and their own things, and they go to out to a foreign land where they don't know anybody, and they have to live on whatever is there, and they've gone specifically to preach the gospel to, a, to an unreached people group. That's suffering. And our brothers and sisters in Christ who are imprisoned, beaten, tortured for Christ's sake, that's suffering. And that I may so share his sufferings, and that's not to all those big ways of suffering is not to diminish the ways that believers in Christ suffer in the West, in Trinidad and Tobago, in the city of San Fernando, where we live, where people speak against you, they misunderstand you, they slander, gossip about you, try to bring you down just because of your stand in Christ, where your co-workers speak against you because you will not engage in the gossip or you will not engage in stealing things from the office It's suffering. But he says, and that I may so share his sufferings as to be continually transformed. Yes, what's also included in suffering for us. It's when we see somebody, the Holy Spirit puts it on your heart to speak to somebody and our flesh is like the old dog by the fire would rather not because, you know, I don't know them. And what, what if they cuss me out? And what if, and what if they don't get healed and I pray for them and they don't? All that is going on in here. But we decide to deny that and say, I'm doing it, Lord. That pain that you feel, that like, mm, that suffering. But it's a good pain. It's called Obedience. Anywho, moving on. And so that I may so share his sufferings as to be continually transformed, everybody say transform, in spirit into his likeness, even to his death in the hope that if possible I may attain to the spiritual and moral resurrection that lifts me out from among the dead even while in this body, even while I'm in this physical flesh and blood. I experience the resurrection of Christ and so I'm living at a spirit. In, in the spiritual and moral resurrection in this body. And in verse 12, it says, not that, he says, not that I have now attained this ideal or have already been made perfect, but, we say but, but, 
but I press on to lay hold of, to grasp, to make my own. As I said, this is not something in the great by and by. We're not waiting till Beulah land to live this thing out. That's very passive way of living. This is not the life that we've been called to. Oh, yes, in the great by and by. Are there things that we're going to get there that we can't get here? Absolutely, yes. But this, living this Christ-like life out now is for now. Ooh, we got to take some territory, folks. I press on to lay hold of and grasp and make my own that for which Christ Jesus, the Messiah, has laid hold of me and made me his own. Verse 13, I do not consider, brethren, that I have captured and made it my own yet, but one thing I do. Look at your neighbor and say, one thing I do. It is my one aspiration for getting, go ahead, it is my one aspiration Forgetting what lies behind. Ooh, that's for somebody in here. Forgetting what lies behind. Forgetting what happened this morning. Forgetting what happened yesterday. Forgetting what happened last week. Forgetting what happened 10 years ago. Forgetting what happened five years ago. Forgetting all that. Forgetting how I missed it back then. How I missed it with this one. How I spoke those words and I shouldn't have. Forgetting all that behind. Forgetting my failures and what I didn't, how I didn't reach it behind. Forgetting Forgetting all that, forgetting all that. I strain forward to what lies ahead. Greater things are yet to come. Greater things are still to be done in this city. I press, verse 14, I press on toward the goal to win the supreme and heavenly prize to which God in Christ Jesus is calling us upward. I press. There's a song by Fred Hammond, I press. I love that song. Can't sing it, but. It's so good having Mika here. She laughs at all my jokes. She gets me. She gets me. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you. Verse 15. So, let those of us who are spiritually mature and full grown have this mind and hold these convictions. What convictions? The ones going up from... Up to verse 9, inclusive. And if in any respect you have a different attitude of mind, God will make that clear to you also. Notice he doesn't say, you know, um, those of us who are spiritually mature and full grown have this mind and hold these convictions. And if any, if in any respect you have a different attitude of mind, well, then that's okay. No problem. Just go on in that. Notice he doesn't say that. He says, and if in any respect you have a different attitude of mind, God will make that clear to you also. He doesn't back up at all. He says, got to make it clear to you. Verse 16, only, everybody say only. Only. Let us hold true to what we have already attained and walk and order our lives by that. What does he mean? Whatever it is, whatever revelation, according to the word, and it's and it's in line with the word of God that you have received, walk in that. Don't be looking at anybody else. I love Peter. Peter, the apostle Peter, who says to Jesus, Jesus, Jesus is risen from the dead. He's about to be ascended to heaven. And him and him and Peter and the disciples are walking together. And, and, uh, and, and Jesus says to him, follow, follow me, right? And, and, uh, and Peter looks at John, who's nearby, because, you know, John, the one that Jesus loved, right? And so he looks at John and he goes, he goes, Lord, what about, what about him? And Jesus says, 
I'm just going to paraphrase. None of your business. <laughs> you follow me. So don't be, so what he's trying to say is, don't be looking at this one on that. Don't be looking at Pastor Maureen and say, oh, but I, I wish I could live, I wish I could be like Pastor Maureen. I wish I could pray like Pastor Maureen. I wish I could do, walk in the things of God like Pastor Maureen. And I'm not there now. And so I just, you know, it's not for me. You know, might as well just, I just give up, you know, just. No, he says, what, what you hold to be true, what you have already attained, uh, walk and order yourself by that. What you've got, live that out. Use that that you've got. And as you use that, as you walk in faith, as you step out and walk in faith, in what you've got, more will be given to you then. Only let us hold true to what we have already attained and walk and order our lives by that. Verse 17, brethren, he says, together follow my example and observe those who live after the patterns we have set for you. Verse 18, I'm going to read this verse. I, 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 you know, it's kind of difficult to read, but, you know, it's kind of painful to understand that this is true. But it is true because it's in the word. He says, for there are many, and he's talking about in the, in in congregations, in gatherings of the people of God, in, in the body, in, in churches. Not, he's not talking about outside the, in the world here. He says, for there are many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears. He said, it's painful for me to say this to you. But there are many who walk and live as enemies of the cross of Christ, the anointed one. They are doomed and their fate is eternal misery or perdition. He goes on to say their God, small g, is their stomach. Their God is their appetites, you know, the drives. Their God, their God is their stomach, their appetites, their sensuality. Living only by the five senses. That's their God. It actually leads them. Their five senses, their sensuality, their appetites actually control and lead them. And he says, and, they, and not only do that, they glory in their shame. Siding with earthly things and being of their party. Verse 20, but, he says, let me say but. But, no, no, say it like you mean it, no, you're sleepy, we're coming to an end now. Everybody say but. But, but we are citizens, woo, the, we are citizens of the state, the commonwealth, the homeland, which is in heaven. And from it, every time I get to that part, and from it, and from it, we are to live from heaven to earth, not from earth to heaven. Our perspective, oh boy, our perspective is heaven to earth, not earth to heaven. We're not striving, trying to call down the things of God. We are sons and daughters of God. We have the backing of heaven. We live according to the word. This is our position that Christ has given us. Actually, the Father has given us joint seating with Christ. Amen. But we are citizens of the state, the commonwealth, the homeland, which is in heaven. And from it also, we earnestly and patiently await the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, as Savior. I was telling the folks last night that 3%, they did a survey, 3%, you know, when you've been doing a percentage, it's 100% is the percentage, right? 3% out of 100%, 3% of professing Christians believe that Jesus is coming back. Oh, dear. And less than the 3% that believe is coming back, 
less than that 3% actually live their life expecting him to come. Most of them, yeah, has he come back? Yes, but they just live in like, whatever, 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 whatever. Like if, you know, just like it says, just like in the days of Noah, men were eating and drinking and marrying. It's not like there's something wrong with eating and drinking and marrying, but it's just like they were just carrying on, like, you know, everything's just going to continue. Normal. Until the day the flood broke. And then it was too late. But we are citizens of the state, the commonwealth of heaven homeland which is in heaven and from it also we earnestly and patiently await the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ the Messiah as Savior but he say as Savior <sighs> verse 21 who will transform who meaning he will transform and fashion anew the body of our humiliation that's this physical body to conform to and be like the body of his glory and majesty. How is he going to do it? By exerting that power which enables him even to subject everything to himself. <sighs> we are, we are, if we dare to do it, to be living with heaven's perspective on our personal situations and on the earth. John 3.13, it's not there. I'm just going to, you can just jot the scripture down and read it. I'm reading it from the Amplified Classic Edition. I, actually, I was going to gloss, gloss by it, but I was urged not to. So I'm going to go back to it. John 3.13. And it says, and yet, Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus at night, because Nicodemus has come to him in secret, because he's a teacher, of, he's a leader of the Pharisees, and he's not supposed to be cavorting with this revolutionary guy called Jesus and he says Jesus says and yet no one has ever gone up to heaven but there is one who has come down from heaven the son of man himself who is in heaven that was his perspective that's how he lived on the earth his awareness was of heaven even as he walked the earth and that's supposed to be ours that's where he's pulling us and drawing us to. So let's read verse 20 again, and then we'll slide straight into verse 21. But we are citizens of the state. Let's read it together. But we are citizens of the state, the commonwealth, the homeland, which is in heaven. And from it also, we earnestly and patiently await the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah as Savior, who will transform and fashion anew the body of our humiliation to conform to and be like the body of his glory and majesty by exerting that power which enables him even to subject everything to himself. This corruption will put on incorruption. This physical body that we had, Jesus had a body just like ours when he walked the earth, you know, could pinch him, it would hurt, just like ours, right? Same, exactly the same as ours. But when he died and he rose from the dead, he received a glorified body and we will be like him. <laughs> It's so good. I'm excited. I'm excited. Mm. I invite you to stand to your feet. And let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word.
Jesus, thank you for this place of grace that you have caused us to firmly and safe, safely stand in. Holy Spirit, we ask you, Lord, to stir us up on the inside. Remind us to be in constant fellowship with you, just like our big brother Jesus was. Remind us to be in constant fellowship with you, communing with you, listening to you, receiving your instruction and direction, and at the same time, just enjoying the love of our Father. Help us to enjoy his love even more to enjoy his embrace on purpose, intentionally. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Thank you.